you pray with me? Holy God, we seek your spirit now. Move in this place. Speak to our hearts. Move in our spirits. Let us know you better. Follow you closer by the way you are here now in this moment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is my name? That's the question asked by the lawyer in our gospel passage today. And if this question has formed the basis for thousands of sermons through the centuries and the millennia, including a few of my own. I've not preached thousands yet, but I've preached many on this sort of topic, and that question has been a part of it. It's a good question, an important question. For certainly in our world where we divide ourselves into groups of us and them, into ins and outs, into good and bad, and so on and so on, we need the reminder that we're all connected, that all are our neighbors. But I'm not sure it's actually the question Jesus answers in this text. Or at the very least, Jesus answers that question by implying a whole different question and answering it instead. And while I want to promise to never ask the question of who is my neighbor again in a sermon, this morning, I want to focus on that other question I think Jesus asks which is not, who is my neighbor, but how can I be a neighbor? On the one hand, the answer is pretty easy to affirm to decide. The lawyer himself gives it to us, and Jesus affirms his answer. How are we a neighbor to others? By loving them. Love God and love neighbor, the lawyer answers Jesus, is the most important commandment. Yes, Jesus says, this is right. This is the way to life. Life eternal. Life at its fullest right now. Life as God intends it. Love God and love neighbor. This is what Jesus says. What the lawyer affirms. And scriptures all throughout our Bibles affirm it as the way God expects us to act. To borrow language from Amos, this is this love for each other and love for God is the plumb line that God sets for us. It's how we are judged, how we ought to judge ourselves. Do you want to know if a particular action or word or decision honors God? Well, then ask. Does it show love for God? Does it show love for neighbor? If the answer to those questions is yes, there's a pretty good chance that God would indeed bless it. If the answer to those questions is no, then there's a pretty good chance that we should stop and think and rethink about whether or not that action or decision or word that we're about to say is what we ought to do. Love God. Love neighbor. That's how we be a neighbor. How we are called to be as Christians. Now, this is not easy to live out. See basically every sermon preached ever. All we're doing up here is trying to help us all discern how we do that on a daily, annual basis. But the concept is as simple as it is important. If you want to be neighbors and disciples, we should seek to love God and love him. But in this text, Jesus gives us an example to help us better discern what that might look like. That example is a Samaritan. The person in the story that we are obviously meant to follow. The Samaritan sees the Israelite man on the ground near death and loves him or at least acts out of love for him. He sees a person that's told the kids who might be thought of as enemy, who certainly would have considered him other. Yet he cares for him. He showed love, shows love for his neighbor and becomes the model for how we are to be neighbor to others. As I look at his part of the story, I see at least two aspects of what this love looks like, of what being a neighbor might look like. 
First, the Samaritan gives of himself and his resources and gives of them generously. He stops. He takes time. He listens and observes the needs of the man half dead. He pauses in his busy schedule. You know, he probably has somewhere to go, just like the priest and the Levite did. But unlike them, he stops. He pauses. He discerns that the needs of this man are greater than his own needs to get to where he is going. He puts aside his busyness to help a man in need. To see the Israelite on the ground. To listen to him. To care for him. He shares his very self to make certain that the man gets the care he needs. And then he also shares with his resources. He gives the innkeeper a pretty good payment as he's leaving to care for the man in his sickness, his recovery. And he also promises to pay any future expenses going forward. So that the man who had been left half dead would be cared for. The Samaritan knew that when someone is truly in need, they need both someone who will see them and care for them and somebody to pay the bill. They're important. They work together. And here I want to tell you that unlike a Samaritan, we don't have to always do both of those all the same time. We might have moments that we can do both. One example I often that this is down. One example I often do is if I'm out and I see a homeless person who asks for money for a meal, sometimes I just go buy them a meal. That is doing both. That is seeing them and caring for their needs and paying the bill. But more often than not, we'll do one or the other. And that's okay. Sometimes we don't have the wealth or resources to share out of our pockets. But we have time and wisdom to share. We can share companionship or company in a carpool. We can share moments, conversation, listening ears and shoulders to cry on or to laugh with or to discern with, to struggle with, to bear each other's anxieties and worries and fears. These matter. These are important. And I don't want to say they're free because our time is not free, our emotional energy is not free, but they are not things that require us to use our money. And they're as important as anything else. Other times, though, we will have the resources to help out materially. And the God that has a claim on both our time and our treasure expects us to sometimes share that treasure in ways makes sense. Sometimes we are called to share from our pocketbooks, to share of our wealth, our physical, monetary, and otherwise gifts, to best be a neighbor to those around us, to best be a neighbor to the world. But whether time or treasure or some combination thereof, the Samaritan shows us that a part of what it takes to be a neighbor is to give freely and generously of ourselves. The other thing, that's a willingness to take a risk in how we love. The Samaritan does. For one, the Samaritan takes a risk physically. The road from Jericho to Jerusalem was among the most dangerous roads in all of the ancient Near East. To stop, especially alone, on that road was to literally put one's life in danger. Even the man on the side of the road could have been a trap, could have been a trick. The Samaritan saw a man in need and knew that in this case stopping was what he had to do. He took a physical risk, a very real one, but he also took a different risk, even greater. The risk 
of reaching out where he may not have been welcome. I already alluded to it, and it's been preached a lot, so you probably know already, but Samaritans and Jews didn't really get along with each other very well. I said they could have been enemies, but that's almost not quite right. They were more like feuding cousins or feuding siblings. They were, they were close. They both worshipped Yahweh, but their disagreements with how to do that worship were so harsh to come to blows. A Samaritan helping out a Jew, and Jew accepting such help? Well, that's utterly unexpected. That's utterly ludicrous and laughable. No one in Jesus' day would have believed it. We have the term Good Samaritan in our, in our lexicon because of the Bible text, but in Jesus' day, the phrase said to his fellow Jews, the Good Samaritan, would have been an oxymoron. Such things didn't exist. So there was no small risk by the Samaritan in stopping to help the Jewish man on the side of the road. And that's probably where most of our risk is likely to be. I am grateful and thankful every day of my life that we don't usually he had a physical risk of death and dismemberment by loving others. I won't say never, but usually we don't risk our physical health by caring for those around us. But our emotions, oh yeah, rejection, risking what it takes to reach out to an enemy, a person you don't like or agree with, all out of love, that's a risk really is. And it's the kind of risk Jesus calls us into, and the kind of risk our world desperately needs. I will not say that we are in a time in our history where we were the most polarized ever as a nation. Because, for one, I remember from history books, the history of this nation when this building was built, this sanctuary was built. You know, that would be 1859, right around the Civil War. And, praise the Lord, I don't think we're quite yet at a place as a nation where we echo or echoing the Civil War and half a million dead. So we're not the most polarized ever. But, friends, we're not exactly in a kumbaya moment as a nation either. We are a nation that often feels very divided. And it can take effort in this moment to see those people as people worthy of love. Even more, to see ourselves as the ones called to do the body. Because we are their neighbors. That is our call. Republican or Democrat or Libertarian, whether they propose their opponents of Black Lives Matter or other, other causes, whether or not they think tax cuts are the world's best economic policy, or instead we should raise taxes on the rich, or all the places in between. No matter how they feel about Dobbs or Roe or other controversial Supreme Court justice cases. They are our neighbors. We are called to love them. We don't have to agree with them. We can disagree with each other all the time. We don't have to give up our own political opinions. You know, I have plenty of mine, and I'm not going to give them up. We are called to love. To love those who we agree with, who we like, we sit to use with, to love those who we don't agree with, who we don't like, who we might still sit in pews with. Sometimes that means caring for each other. Meals, cards, words of love and encouragement. Sometimes that means sitting and having good conversations together, even about the issues of the day, knowing that none of us have all the wisdom. 
None of us are always right. And we need other perspectives to help us see this side of an issue or that side of the question. And sometimes, especially in the church, that means agreeing to come to the table together, even when we don't agree about the issues of the day, and breaking bread, cherry cup, and being the church, being the human family God made us to be. The actual actions will vary based on circumstance and context. But the heart of this story of our call as Christians, of how we are meant to live our lives, is finding ways to love one another, to love all of our neighbors. But that's what it means to be a neighbor. Who is my neighbor, the lawyer asked. And Jesus makes it clear that all people are. But also, this is the wrong question. Instead, we should be asking how we can be a neighbor. That is to love. Love God. Love each other no matter what. Love. For that is what it means to be neighbors. Thanks be to God.